I'm going to call this hearing to order. We're a little bit ahead of schedule, but not so much. Um, I want to thank uh, Secretary McDonough and, and our VSO uh, friends and partners for joining us today. For those of you that are joining us on uh, television, uh, I would just say that you're, you'll hear a great opening and questioning of the Secretary of the VA. And then what's really going to be interesting is we have um, three folks from the VSOs, Morgan Brown, Shane Lerman, and Patrick Murphy, who are going to do a combined statement, uh, which will be particularly entertaining, I think. Uh, so it'll be good. So we have something to look forward to. And we do. Right. We do. We are here to take a closer look at the President's fiscal year 2024 budget request from the Department of Veterans Affairs. At a time when there is unprecedented demand for VA health care and services, we have to ensure the Department is well equipped to care for our veterans. Over the last fiscal year, a VBA completed more than 1.7 million disability compensation and pension claims. A lot and a new record it was. And VHA served over 6.3 million veteran patients through more than 115 million appointments. Truth is, demand is only increasing. Last summer, Congress came together to pass the PACT Act, a historic step that has already delivered all areas of toxic exposed veterans and survivors their VA care and benefits that they have earned, by the way. This law created a cost of war toxic exposure fund to cover the new costs of delivering this earned support. I have serious concerns with proposals out of the House to gut the fund, whether it's attempts to relitigate re the nature or purpose of the fund or to place artificial caps or make dramatic cuts to the fund. It's all bad news. And I might say this. We send folks off to war. We put it on the credit card. They come back, and we make excuses not to fund their, their benefits. Um, in Montana, they say that that is... Uh, uh, something comes out of a backside of a bull. Anyway, after finally making good on our long overdue pledge to address the costs of, to of war for toxic exposed veterans, our next step cannot be to immediately renege on that pledge. I'm also concerned with the House efforts to rescind $1.8 billion we already appropriated for delivering veterans health care, reimbursing community care providers, and improving health care facilities. And let's not forget, even if our House colleagues make good on their promise to not gut VA health care, there are plenty of programs out the, outside the VA that are absolutely critical for veterans and their families. Job training programs and efforts to combat veterans' homelessness are just a couple of examples of what will most surely next be on the chopping block. And make no mistake, by tying drastic cuts to the debt ceiling, my House colleagues are putting veterans' benefits and livelihoods at risk. Each month, Treasury makes approximately $25 billion in payments on half of the VA. $25 billion in payments. So of that $25 billion, nearly half is for benefits payments for more than 7 million veterans and their families, folks who serve this country. The rest pays for VA employees, salaries, keeps VA medical clinics open, and reimburses private providers for folks who receive care in the community. If the debt limit is reached, all these payments could be delayed or stopped creating incredible uncertainty for this nation and for the veterans who have served this country and made the nation it is today. So let's get past the political posturing and ensure our nation's veterans aren't harmed because their representatives in Congress can't act like adults and do what they were sent here to do. They've forgotten their mission. With that said, I look forward to hearing directly from Secretary McDonough and the VSOs here today on their concerns, priorities, and impressions of the FY24 budget for the VA, with that, I turn it over to my friend, Senator Jerry Moran. Chairman Tester, thank you, and good afternoon to you, and welcome to Secretary McDonough and to our VSO witnesses. Uh, I appreciate all of you being with us today, and I look forward to hearing your testimony about the VA's FY24 budget request. There has been some big changes, as the chairman uh, mentioned, uh, since the last time we met for this purpose, namely the enactment of the Sergeant First Class Heath Robinson honoring our PACT Act. I know that one thing that has not changed is that there is bipartisan, bicameral commitment to provide resources that are needed to support veterans and their caregivers, survivors, and dependents. I'm committed to protecting and prioritizing support for veterans in the ongoing budget talks, and I know that my colleagues in the House and Senate share that commitment. Nearly 70 percent of the federal spending is on autopilot, or what is known as mandatory programming. This passive approach to the federal budget is what got us in this deficit mess in the first place. Veterans are not insulated from rising inflation and slowed economic growth caused by out-of-control spending. 
As a longtime member and now ranking member of this committee, my priority will always be to make certain that the VA has the funding it needs to provide timely and high quality health care benefits and services to the men and women who served our nation. I believe this and every VA budget request could be judged through a single lens, and that is what will it deliver, deliver for veterans? This year's budget request is once again the largest yet for the VA, totaling $325.1 billion. That's a big number, and it should lead to big improvements for veterans. My point uh, that I'm trying to make is that we ought not, and I've done it perhaps myself, I don't need to say perhaps, I've done it myself from time to time, in which we brag about the amount of money that we've spent or the increases that we're providing for veterans. But if bigger numbers were all that is needed to deliver, we'd have better results. And so it's what we can deliver. With bigger numbers and better results, we still wouldn't have higher veteran suicide rates, hundreds of thousands of veterans waiting on claim backlog for their earned benefits, a troubled new electronic health record, 12 months of trend, 12 months trend of meaningful decline in access to care according to the VA's own quality data, scores of recent reports from the Inspector General and Government Accounting Office detailing serious and sometimes fatal failures, persistent problems getting the VA to provide timely responses to basic requests for information from this committee. I'm interested in hearing this, I'm, I'm, excuse me, I'm interested in hearing from the Secretary this afternoon on how this budget request will produce different results from past years. I'm also interested in hearing the Secretary justify budget increases for VA health care that far outpace the demand for VA health care. The Veterans Health Administration is re requesting a 11% increase, but the projected need for that increase is 3.5%. This is also the first budget request that includes the Toxic Exposure Fund, and the VA is asking for $20 billion for the fund in fiscal year 24. However, when the fund was established in the PACT Act nine months ago, it was not projected to reach $20 billion until the fiscal year of 2030, six years from now. Given that the VA still does not have a way to track the number of veterans who are enrolling under the PACT Act's enhanced eligibility authorities, and has certainly not raised this concern about an unexpectedly high influx of veteran patients or claimants, this request needs explaining. Delivering more money for veterans is not the solution, but delivering better outcomes is. Uh, I have no doubt but what the Secretary shares. I, I wouldn't want to put you in my category, but I have no doubt that we disagree, that, we, that there's any disagreement about the need for better results. For these reasons, it's critical that Congress put veterans first by remaining engaged in the budget process and avoiding the urge to turn a blind eye to issues facing the VA through more mandatory spending. It is time we get it right for our veterans, their loved ones, and I thank you once again for all being here. And Mr. Secretary, I look forward to our conversation. Uh, thank you, Senator Moran. And I think uh, I agree with the point you made on uh, the money. And we all talk about how much money has increased when, in fact, it's how the money's spent that's really important here. And that, that not only includes the VA, that includes every budget we have put our hands on. So uh, today's hearing, as I said earlier, will consist of two panels. Up first, we have the great honor to have the Secretary of the VA, Secretary Dennis McDonough, to talk about the VA 2024 budget and uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly of it. Great. So thank you. Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator Moran, Senator Brown, Senator Tillis, thanks so much for the opportunity to be here. If it's all the same to you, I'll submit my prepared remarks uh, into the record and we'll just get uh, straight to your questions. And, and uh, I know you have my longer statement, but if you wouldn't mind making the shorter one part of the record too, we might as well just get right at it. Well, that's good. Uh, now I is feel that okay with you? Now I feel guilty. Yeah, I know, I know, yeah. that's good. <laughs> yeah, that's a great opening statement. Uh, <laughs> That'll get you points right off the bat, right? Uh, Mr. Secretary, in your, in your testimony that you have written, um, you highlighted the VA has delivered more care and more benefits to more veterans over the last two years than any time in our nation's history. Um, put more of that in perspective for us. Yeah, well, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it is important to keep in mind that uh, these big numbers do lead to 
uh, better outcomes. And you know, we uh, we're we're not big on uh, just measuring what we put into uh, what you uh, what, what you give us to put into uh, veterans care, but we actually measure uh, what it means for veterans and their families. And just last Thursday, there was a, a release of a report that actually was a consolidation of 40 separate reports looking at care provided by the VA, including throughout the pandemic. And what the, re, that report uh, from one of the leading medical journals in the country found is that VA provided care is at least as good as and overwhelmingly, in an overwhelming number of cases, better than care provided in other uh, settings, including uh, private healthcare settings. So we're very proud of that. But if you just consider the clinical appointments uh, and engagements we've had with vets in the last year, 115 million clinical encounters, 40 million inpatient uh, encounters at VA facilities, 31 million telehealth appointments, uh, 38 million community care appointments. So you already talked through the benefits side of this at the 1.5 million claims uh, that we processed last year. Right now we're 15% ahead of that number year on year. Um, but the point is uh, these dollars mean real engagements. These engagements mean better outcomes for veterans. Uh, and I stand by the, uh, the assertion that we're now providing more benefits and more care to more vets than at any time in the VA's history. Can you tell me what uh, the veteran looks like? The, the first time veterans entering the system, who are they? Well, the most, uh, the, the fastest growing cohort of veterans right now are women veterans. Uh, we have uh, just as a result of the PACT Act, we publish this data every two weeks. Uh, we have 77,000 new enrollees uh, in VA healthcare. Um, you know, as I say, the fastest growing cohort are women veterans, but the beauty of the act, the PACT Act that you all gave us last year and the president signed in August is that it allows us to restart a conversation with younger and more diverse veterans at the same time that we're deepening our engagement with Vietnam veterans, including those who have hypertension. Um, as a result of their exposure to Agent Orange. So uh, we're seeing younger veterans, more diverse veterans, including more gender diverse veterans, meaning more women, uh, in our care, and we're seeing that directly as a result of the PACT Act. So there has been debate over the last couple weeks about the bill that the House passed that uh, cut programs. Uh, and the debate, most of the debates, actually revolved around veteran benefits. In fact, Senator Moran addressed it in his opening statement. And by the way, Senator Moran's an honest broker, and I believe what he says when he says we want to make sure that veterans' f f benefits and health care and programs are funded. But as I looked at that bill, um, they attempted to rescind $1.8 billion for VA medical services, ID modernization, and facilities. $1.8 billion. And the question for me becomes, if we didn't cut any veteran benefits, this isn't called benefits because it has to do with administration. I guess that's the way they look at it, although VA medical services is VA medical services. You've had a chance to look at that bill. You've had a chance to look at the proposal put out by your, by your agency. Tell me, just give me a, a blush of what, what, you, what you see that comes out of that and what kind of impacts that would have if that came to fruition. A bill that, by the way, uh, the speaker said did not cut benefits, in fact, called the president a liar, when in fact the president was the one who was telling the truth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, it's obviously the bill itself uh, is vague uh, for the reasons that you talked about, and so it's difficult uh, to ascertain, but... We, we've looked at this a lot of different ways. We've been talking with members uh, on all sides uh, of this debate since January when this debate really uh, bega got uh, engaged. And so if you just apply the 22% budget cut to VA, uh, which again may not be what ends up happening at the end of the day, maybe it's less than that, 
Um, but if you just if you just take the top lines of the bill and you recognize that VA is not held harmless, the way, uh, for example, DOD is held harmless in the bill, then we're going to be confronted with very significant challenges. I would just give two examples. We think that if those, not, if, if again, if that 22% cut is applied to VA healthcare, that would mean 30 million fewer outpatient visits of the type that I just talked through that we had last year. Uh, that, and those are outpatient visits in the direct care system or in the community care system. Uh, alternatively, if you look at it from the benefits administration, uh, again, I talked about the fact that uh, claims filed are 30% above where they were a year ago. We are uh, fulfilling 15% more claims year on year than we did a year ago. Uh, and we're able to do that because some efficiency we've found, but also because of hiring we've carried out. Uh, if you apply the 22% reduction at VBA, that would mean 6,000 fewer staff there. We have 28,000 staff there for the first time. So we're, uh, you know, we've talked many of the members of this committee through how our staffing model works, where we are in that staffing model. But if there's 6,000 fewer personnel to process claims, that'll be an extension of a timeline that's already too long yep. for vets to get their benefits. More delay, Senator Moran. Chairman, thank you. Uh, Mr. Secretary, um, the VA Inspector General recently found that a substantial, there was a substantial commingling between the $14.4 billion in supplemental funding the VA received under COVID-19 related care and the VA's regular appropriations. It seems to me that would be separate accounts, but that's not what the, v the, the inspector found is my understanding of yes. what I read. Uh, the intent of the supplemental was to support urgent time limited needs, kind of one time or one period of time circumstances not to create uh, an artificial increasing of the VA's budget. What steps did the VA take to make sure cost projections for the fiscal year that we're talking about, 20 years we're talking about, 24 and 25, were not based upon those supposed one-time amounts of money? Yeah, it's a fair question. So uh, this has been uh, an historic challenge for VA. How, how does it account for supplemental funding? Uh, and this goes back many, many years, it has to do with the the age of our infrastructure and how we track this stuff. And it also has to do with where we push the money to for our operators to execute it. So the, the important thing we've done is we've now taken responsibility for that, the, the outlays of those dollars, and put it in the hands of the CFO here in headquarters. And we're making sure that he and I are directly responsible ultimately for the, how we pay those. Those funds being the COVID funds? B those funds being the medical care ah. funds. And uh, so rather than make a, every individual facility have to account and try to figure out where this money comes from and what color it is, we're, we're going to make sure that we do it at, at headquarters. Uh, we've worked that out with OMB. And we've been briefing your staff about this. As we think this is an important change. Secondly, we have regularly uh, updated the committee on how it is that we are spending these funds. And that's why we can have the confidence that we have now that we will use the overages that we've had to date, which remember those overages were for uh, what we expected to be a surge of care as people come back to us at the end of the pandemic. We've had that conversation in this room. Uh, we have great confidence that we'll use that money this year uh, and partially into next year. Uh, our regular updates to you guys help us do that. But the IG has routinely raised this issue of supplemental funds with us. We're trying to figure out a good way to do it. Um, we think, uh, as I said, bringing responsibility of this to the CFO level is the way to do it. Um, but none of this uh, obviates the need to continue to stay in close touch with the committee and make sure that the committee sees very clearly into how we're spending the money. I understand that the VA plans to track expenditures from the Toxic Exposure Fund to ensure they're justified. Yes. 
Uh, how will the VA define and track which health care is associated with exposure to environmental hazards and which care is not pursuant to the law that created the fund? So this, uh, we, we've had now, I think, a, a handful of discussions with your, with your teams uh, here in the committee and then with others on, uh, among the appropriators and in the House uh, as well about our methodology. Uh, we, we are comfortable with our methodology. We've worked this through with OMB. Uh, we're working it through with your team. I think, you know, I'll let them characterize to you their, their, their degree of comfort. If we have to change that methodology, we'll do it. But the base case for the TEF is that uh, we're, uh, we're in a position uh, to ensure that as the law envisioned, toxic exposure funds will be allowed, will be spent only for toxic exposure uh, requ requirements. And we've made sure that we've given clear guidance to the field, uh, again, operating as we, as we do with the CFO uh, and me responsible for this uh, to make sure that we can execute in that way. So the problems that, or the, the lack of accounting of the money from COVID, uh, which you're now trying to address by bringing it to the central office, that is not anything that would suggest that the same problem will occur for the money in the fund for toxic exposure. We won't have the same problem we had with COVID money being commingled. We will be able, the department will be able to determine what is uh, appropriately spent for toxic exposure benefits. Yeah, we, we think we think yes. Uh, uh, and again, the methodology for, uh, the basis on which we've uh, established that methodology uh, to track that funding is something that we're talking through with your teams in, in very minute detail. Uh, but we're also gonna obviously continue to uh, not only talk to you, but continue to be uh, subject to the IG's oversight, to the GAO's oversight, to OMB's oversight. Uh, and if there is something we need to change, we'll change it. But we have, we have great confidence that we'll, we'll be able to invest the toxic exposure dollars for toxic exposure care. Mr. Secretary, thank you. Senator Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate what you said about DOD being held harmless and the VA not. And uh, Senator Tester and Chairman Tester and I and others fighting for the PACT Act, remember, last summer when it was perilous whether it was going to pass because some people said it was too expensive. And I do roundtables. I'm going to do one on the PACT Act in every county in the state. I think the, I did the 31st one the other day. And there is a sentiment that there's, that, you know, there's always money for defense, but we, too many people want to skimp on spending on the VA. So, Mr. Chairman, thank you for, for your work on that. Um, uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you for, for all that you're doing in so many ways. I want to thank you for taking the right step in stopping the electronic health records uh, issue uh, rollout. I, I know we've talked many times. I appreciate your, your attention to that and your understanding there. The staff at Chalmers in Columbus, uh, their hard work I visited there as you have and as your staff has, and uh, you did the right thing, and we want to keep working with you. Um, I, I want, want to talk about, about the PACT Act a little bit. Could, could you, how, do you have numbers, up-to-date numbers, on how many veterans have already taken advantage of it? Because I, I like to say when I do these roundtables that this is government done right. This bill passed, if I remember, in August of, of 2022. Yeah. By January, you were headed up and running, and hundreds of thousands of veterans were getting care. And that's, that's, that's exactly the way government should run, and, and uh, all of us are proud to be part of that. Do you have any up-to-date numbers on how many people have been served? Yeah, well, thanks very much. As of uh, May 6th, 251,584 total veterans or survivors have had completed PACT Act related claims. We're, we're granting at about 80%. That's the beauty of the presumption, is that we're able to grant at a much higher rate. It's 79.7%. .7%. Um, the average, this is a, a troubling number, the average days for completing a PACT Act related claim right now is 155 days. Uh, I think there's uh, a series of reasons for that. I think the biggest is that some claims were filed either related to our initial three presumptive claims 
or filed shortly after the president signed the law, and we did not begin to uh, process the PACT Act claims until January. Um, so we should see that average number of days uh, go down. Um, and we have about, as I said earlier, about 77,000, a little over 77,000 new enrollees in VHA healthcare as a result of that. We have many more uh, existing enrollees who qualify for greater access to care as a result of the PACT Act as well. Thank you. Um, I was at a, I participated in, I mean, as an observer in a screening event at the Toledo CBOC in Northwest Ohio in March. And it was an illuminating experience to see what veterans go through. I know you're, you've been more hands-on than any VA secretary I've ever seen in terms of going out and seeing that in action. I heard from burn pit veterans and advocates who need additional screening. Many of them are in poor health and had to have invasive uh, lung biopsies ordered to complete these diagnoses. What steps is the VA taking to implement less invasive diagnostic techniques such as advanced technology screenings? Yeah. Well, the, so uh, the toxic exposure screenings that you talked about and that are enabled by the, by the law, we've now had about 3.3 million vets complete those screenings. It's very interesting uh, because in somewhere between 35 and 40 percent, uh, I, haven't, I, haven't, I don't have the most recent number. I've, it fluctuates in there of cases of those screenings. We have veterans about whom we learned some new exposure that they that, that veteran may have experienced. Uh, so that's allowing us to get to know the veterans already in our care better. Uh, there are technological challenges on one of the things that we think most veterans suffer from, which is uh, 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 bronchiolitis, which the tests for which are so invasive as to make them uh, actually not useful uh, or potentially harmful to the veteran. Uh, so that's why we've stood up and the, the PACT Act enabled us to stand up a uh, special uh, organization focused just on the science of the exposures as well as new techniques to verify the existence of the condition. So, um, you know, uh, that team meets on a regular basis. We just met with them uh, late last week on this. Uh, but not only did you set up uh, the presumptive uh, process for us, but you've also given us additional authorities to make sure that we're testing new technologies to make the confirmation of these conditions, including, including bronchiolitis, less invasive. Thank you, and Mr. Chairman, th thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary, and your help, especially uh, since you've taken office, especially in Chillicothe and, and Cincinnati and Columbus, and your help uh, for the National VA History Center in Dayton. Thank you for all that. Thank you. Thanks, John. Senator Tuckett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Secretary McDonough, thank you for your opening statement, and uh, congratulations on your daughter's thank upcoming you. graduation from the thank fine you. institution and thank 15 you. minutes from my home, Davidson College. Uh, I want to thank you for the briefing you gave me uh, back in my office. Uh, it's uh, probably known to most folks. I voted against the PACT Act, in fact, of the, uh, in spite of the fact that I worked a lot on it. And it, it didn't have anything to do with the numbers. It had to do with operational challenges that I hope we were going to be able to clear up. But you gave me a reason to be optimistic based on uh, the briefing you gave me in the room. Can you give me a 60 second Cliff Notes or give the committee a 60 second Cliff Notes version on some of the risk and how you've managed them. I, I did hear the 150 day, uh, yeah. you, gotta, you gotta bend that down, but yeah. I think you have a plan for doing that. Yeah. Can you share that with me? Yeah, so the, the thank you very much, Senator Tillis. The, the, what we know now after years of watching the, uh, the benefits process in particular, the claims filing process, since that's overwhelmingly the main door that vets first enter at VA, is it's a very human intensive process. So we need to, uh, we, we need to make assessments about how many vets we anticipate filing claims, and we need to make sure that we have trained people ready to handle those claims. So starting in the end of the fiscal year uh, 2021, uh, we began hiring. We now have 28,000 VBA professionals. Importantly, they're not only hired, but there's a good chunk of them are now through the training 
process such that they can begin to add to our ability to reduce the backlog of claims uh, that get filed. A good example of this is that yesterday, we had the single biggest day of claims completion in the history of VA. We completed 9,245 claims yesterday. Uh, that is, we're still getting more claims in, a given, in any given day than that, but we're able now to move many more claims through the process. We can see through the expected surge of claims right now and you got a to the other side strategy. of this, and we have a strategy on how to then manage the size of that workforce through attrition on the other side. I think managing to the peak, but then uh, yep. getting down to what you think the future run rate's gonna be is, is good news. So, you know, count me in to help Thank you. Uh, as we go forward. With respect to the discussion about the, uh, the House bill, the House bill was a House bill. We know that the negotiation that's gonna come from the President and Speaker McCarthy is gonna produce something different, and I think that it's gonna be, uh, Fair to veterans. I, I wanted to talk about one other that you mentioned 77,000 new people. PACT yeah. Act was much publicized. We got more people to contact the VA, even if 20% of them are not getting the presumption. We now have a relationship, and hopefully that's yes. positive for those who maybe didn't get the news on the presumption, but at yes. least they're engaged. We know that the suicide rate among veterans who have no relationship with the VA is higher than those who do. There's a lot of reasons why we need to get people to VA. Uh, there's also a lot of reasons why I'm absolutely sick of the Camp Lejeune toxics ads that are on TV. Uh, however, I think there's a great opportunity there to connect with more veterans. Uh, but I heard, uh, I think it was at a prior committee, an exchange between Senator Sullivan and Senator Hirono on capping fees, which is going to be very difficult to get any consensus on. So. I asked my staff to take a look at drafting a bill that we call the Patriot Bill of Rights. Uh, one of the things that I would like to do is to get support in Congress for a informed uh, veteran before they sign a retainer for these attorneys that are spending millions of dollars in ads. And, and the, the, I think it represents a great opportunity for the VA. I know that they contact the Department of the Navy but I was thinking something as simple as a document before they sign a retainer agreement that says you need to understand what your rights are independently without representation of an attorney. Number one, contact the VA. Uh, number two, contact a local congressional representative. We do thousands of VA uh, cases every year in our, in our office. I'm sure the other members do the same. So make them aware of the fact that Congress members, state offices help veterans every day. Their case may or may not rise to a level to where they need a legal representation. Make them aware of the recognized VSOs who also have experience in this case and let them go through that process before they sign that retainer agreement. What's wrong with that idea? You know, you and I talked about this in your office and uh, this, we, uh, especially on Camp Lejeune where, uh, you know, we just had a study published last week where a, a veteran uh, at Camp Lejeune is 70% more likely to suffer Parkinson's than not, uh, than one not so deployed. Um, we have a lot of presumptives already for Camp Lejeune. So we want to make sure that vets understand you don't have to hire a lawyer to get your VA benefits. And so we're aggressively using our, uh, all of our communications tools to do that. Uh, uh, and having some success with that. So uh, anything that will allow us to get to more of what we call the untethered vets, those vets not yet in relationship with us, uh, is net, net a positive thing as far as we're concerned. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, welcome. Good to see you here. Thank you. Uh, as you know and have told us yesterday, the VA announced that an agreement for the new H EHR contract had been made with Oracle. And it's really important to see that VA is prior prioritizing reliability and responsiveness and patient, patient safety across the contract, so I appreciate that. Um, now, just last week, GAO released a report indicating that the VA had not established target goals to assess user satisfaction, and in, that until it does, VA lacks a basis for determining when satisfaction has improved enough for the system to be deployed at any other sites. 
I support the reset period, as you know, and I support efforts to move forward, but only after, of course, that you are confident about the safety and effectiveness of the system yes. and have a clear, established uh, satisfaction markers. And what matters is what the providers and veterans on the ground think. Our, our veterans, you and I both know, deserve the best health care we can offer, and it's our job to make sure that the VA and Oracle sooner really get this right. Um, I have a couple questions around this. When okay. do you expect to have a revised request for the EHR account in fiscal year 24, as well as an estimate of whether you need the funds requested to support the rollout in the IT and medical facility accounts? So, uh, f first of all, I think uh, I just want to make sure that we're absolutely clear that the roughly a little bit over $400 million that was set aside for this year We've communicated to you in the in the appropriations committee that we do not anticipate needing that money this year. So I want to be very clear about that. One, two, on the updated request, uh, both for the rest of this year and then into next, I think we need a little bit of time, but not much. So I don't, I don't have a specific timeline for you here, but uh, we recognize that uh, this one year option that we're that we've just exercised is a great opportunity for us to test whether we can get those five sites working. Right. And uh, not only that, but we have providers in each of those five sites that you, you've uh, brought to our attention, and we have vets in each of those five sites who have big expectations and they're tired of waiting. So we, we don't, we're not asking for a lot of extra time, but we uh, want to get this right rather than get it fast. So I think we, Rather than give you a firm commitment, I can tell you that this is, you know, number uh, number one issue for us at the at the uh, department to come to the committee with a revised request. Okay, and do you have plans to establish targets to assess user satisfaction? User satisfaction is going to end up being it is uh, a critical part of this. I, I, I whether we have a specific target set, uh, I'll get back to you on that, but. Uh, one of the principal ways we're going to be able to figure out whether we're working in the five tar in the five uh, sites is going to be user satisfaction. So that will be part of the evaluation. Correct. Okay. Whether we have specific targets that are laid out on some timeline is what I. I are I'm are there any of. changes that you've made and plan to make based on provider feedback at this point? Well, uh, a big part of it is the uh, enhanced accountability measures around uptime and system reliability. Mm -hmm. That comes directly from the user experience. Okay, thank you. Well, as you know, we're following this very closely. And I've noticed. really appreciate the VA's diligence on this and we'll want to keep working with you. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Bozeman. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Secretary, again, thank you for being here today. Uh, we enjoyed hearing your priorities regarding the budget last week, and we do appreciate all that you're doing, all the hard work that you're thank doing you. for the men and women that have served. Um, in regard to EHRM, one of the things that I hear from people that aren't on either the authorizing committee or on the uh, uh, you know appropriations committee is, DOD has, you know, has successfully got a bunch of things going in various installations. Yes. We're struggling. I, I support the move to back off. I think that was, you know, yeah. wise of you to do, and I think you've got really good support for doing that. Can you explain why DOD is is having some success? What's what's the difference? Why are we struggling when they didn't? And I know there's good reasons, but would you yeah. expound on that? Yeah, look, I think the number one reason is that we have uh, health systems that are built for different populations and for different outcomes. As a general matter, our patients uh, are with us longer, and our patients, our, our veterans, have more complicated healthcare systems, uh, situations. And so as a result, our system is uh, that much more complicated. Um, so that's, I think that's the main issue. Um, you know, uh, the other question is, you know, when we've struggled with reliability, oftentimes, in fact, in the last three weeks, we've had these two outages for the first time in some 70 plus days. Those outages impact the entire system. 
So it's not just VA. They also impact DOD. And so um, my point is that because of your pressure on us, uh, we, I think, are making the entire system more reliable, including for DOD. Uh, and so uh, I think uh, notwithstanding the fact that our system is more complex and our patients are more, have more demanding healthcare situations, I think the work that you've put us through is going to make the whole system, including for DOD, for Coast Guard, that much more effective. Good. That's helpful. Um, when you came and talked about your budget, you recognized the growth of the number of women veterans seeking uh, care in the VA, which has more than tripled over the last 20 years. Uh, the fiscal year 24 request includes more than $1 billion for gender-specific health, women's health care and $257 million to support the Women's Health uh, Program Office. Last Congress, we had legislation that this uh, Dr. Kate Hendricks Thomas Service Act, which is signed into law. The law expands the eligibility for VHA mammography screenings. Uh, to veterans who are exposed to toxic substances. That's really a, a good story about all that Agreed. we've been able to do, you know, in various ways. Can you touch on how the implementation for the Service Act is going? Yes. And are there any challenges that you're facing that we can be helpful with you? Yeah, well, let, let me start by saying that uh, you've been tireless in giving us additional authorities and additional funding to do exactly all the things that you just took through, and we're very, uh, not only... Uh, very proud of that, but we're very grateful uh, for that. On the Service Act, uh, its implementation is well underway. We began providing breast cancer risk assessments in March of this year, including uh, coincident with the toxic exposure risk assessments. Um, we're working through uh, the development of a dashboard to make sure that you can follow along with the implementation of that. Um, we project that in this fiscal year, as a result of the Service Act, there'll be an additional 52,000 breast cancer risk assessments across all sites. Incidentally, as we learned last week, where now new guidance is that breast, can uh, breast cancer screening should start uh, at 40. Uh, it's pretty clear that your advocacy for the Service Act was uh, well ahead of uh, even this more, this more cutting edge assessment last, uh, last week. There's going to be challenges in some facilities where women veterans are coming to us unenrolled because they've heard about this screening. So that's going to create some administrative burden, but that's, there's not anything, I just want to name that, there's not anything we need from you for that, but that will be a challenge. But that means we're that's getting actually, more vets into our yeah, care. That's, so that's actually good news. news. Ac absolutely good news. Mm -hmm. Absolutely good news. Well, thank you, Mr. Mr. Secretary. Uh, Senator King. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Mr. Secretary, welcome to the committee. Thank you. Um, one of the issues I serve on both armed services and this committee is the transition. Yes. And it, it, it seems to me, even though we've made great progress, we're still not there. Yes. And what I'd like to get from you is some thoughts about how we can uh, make this a warmer handoff, if yes. you will, because th the data suggests that that transition, that two or three year period after leaving active duty, is a is a moment of danger. Yep. Uh, and so uh, I, I wondered if you had some thoughts about how we can how we some some things we might be able to do to to make this uh, uh, a more effective process uh, yeah. in order to protect our veterans. Yes. Uh, I think your your instinct is exactly correct in my view. I've talked about this with, uh, with SecDef. We're looking at this a lot. Uh, I worry sometimes that we think the answer is to overload the transition, the TAP program. Yeah, handing a, a veteran a 300-page yeah. form is not the answer. Right. As you know, I'm not a vet, uh, but... I've signed out of jobs before, like when I was leaving the White House, I'm, I'm, I signed a lot of different things, but I wasn't going to go to any extra thing that, uh, that, I wanted, that I didn't want to go to. Th so what we think very strongly is we need to fit our programming and our opportunities into veterans' lives through a customer experience 
journey rather than make them fit our stuff uh, on our schedule and our form. So, so we're making good progress on this, and that may mean that we're talking to veterans outside the TAP program, yeah. and we're using the program, using that time, as you say, in that year to th three years after they've transitioned to establish a connection with them. Well, one, one suggestion that, that uh, I've been looking at is right now a a, a, an active duty service member has to opt in to have their data conveyed to the veterans right. service officer in the state. If we, made, if we made that an opt out, it would probably increase the, the, the amount of contact. My vision is, frankly, someone meeting the veteran at the airport. Yes. Saying, welcome home, here are some resources, here's my number, here's the VA number. I mean, that, but, but we have to be able to contact the veteran. Now, if they don't want to be contacted, that's fine. Yeah. But we've got this cadre of VSOs and, and people out there that are very willing to help, but we've got to make that connection easier. We're in, we're in conversations with the National Association of State Directors of Veterans Affairs. That, that would be the contact, I think. Yeah, so we're, we're, we've not been a first-rate partner to our, state, uh, to our state partners on this. We give them data. It's not readable. It's not usable. We're trying to make that better. Uh, Here's so. a suggestion. When I was governor, I'd call, my, I'd call our state's 800 numbers just to see what yeah. God is a consumer. Yeah. I, I think, you know, think of yourself as the customer is a good way to approach something like this. Well, these, these, these state directors of Veterans Affairs in each of your state, uh, we're working with each of them uh, in each of your states, they're, they're not shrinking violets. And uh, we're, we're hearing from them that we're not, we've not been a good partner. We're working that because we do think that that ready uh, handoff is really important. Um, uh, just in a limited time, a couple of, couple of points. Uh, I'm still concerned about onboarding time. Yes. And the cumbersomeness of the hiring process. It strikes me that decentralizing it to some extent would be n good, number one. If you, you need to hire an administrative assistant uh, at, at the Togus Hospital in Maine, you shouldn't have to go through Boston and Washington, number right. one. Number two, some reciprocity. So if you've got somebody that's in C Customs and Border Patrol, they don't have to go through a whole new process of background checks and those kinds of things. Some reciprocity would, would speed up the, the process. So I hope that, again, this is one of those things where back away and say, if we were going to design a, a hiring process from scratch with a blank sheet of paper, how, what would it look like? And then compare it to what we have now. Yeah. Well, uh, I appreciate that very much. And uh, we feel like we've had a, a good... We feel like we've had the best two quarters in hiring in basically two decades. Uh, but onboarding is still a major uh, headache. So we are looking at that process from soup to nuts. I talked to, with you yesterday about a couple of things in particular. Uh, the way we handle drug testing does not make any sense to me, for example. But we're getting into the, into the uh, specifics on this to ratchet down that time to onboard. We are losing people because... Uh, We're losing... It's an opportunity cost. We're losing people. Massive we opportunity need. cost. And these are people who want to come to work for VA. And we shouldn't make it so hard. And so we, we've... You know, our time to hire is coming... Our time to onboard is coming down. Good. Uh, but it's coming down in some places, in some visions, uh, from four months. Yeah. Nobody can take a job and then not be paid for four months. Yeah. Okay, so, so we're on this. Uh, I'll continue to report to you on it. Please. But some of those things that you're talking about are, are things we're looking at, uh, deploying, moving authority to hire to the field, uh, simultaneously carrying out the onboarding steps rather than doing them sequentially. Uh, these are all things that we're making good progress on. Mr. Chairman, can you indulge me for one more question? Make it short. Thank you. I knew you'd understand. Uh, the medical records. This is very, it is short. Accountability is crucial. Yes. And uh, I, I, Chair Senator Murray, I think there ought to be targets. If you don't have a destination, you never get there. Yeah. And I think this contract is is very important. But you got to have you got to have standards in it that that uh, provide some accountability and some penalties if they're not met. 
Uh, otherwise, you know, this is such a complex, large process, but ultimately it's got to work. Yeah. And if it doesn't work, the, fe the people who we're contracting with shouldn't get paid. Yeah. So I hope you'll be very tough about accountability. And you've got this one year. Yeah. You've got, a, you've got a, something hanging over them, and I want you to be very uh, aggressive about that. Yeah, we, we're, we're going to do that. I think Senator Murray's challenging us. So I 100% agree. I think we got improved uh, accountability metrics, including uh, enhanced credits when to VA when the system is down, as it has been inexplicably twice in the last, I said three weeks, I think it's the last month. It's maddening. Yeah, there will uh, be a cost to that. There's always a cost to that, and it's measured. You know, we have to measure it in dollars, but it's really measured in in vets uh, in uh, vets out uh, outcomes. Senator yeah. Murray's also challenging us to to be very deliberate about user satisfaction measurement. Um, I take that. Uh, I take what both of you are saying on that, and, and we'll get to the bottom of it. Thank you, I Senator Blackburn. Hearing. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Senator King gave such a great devotion this morning at prayer breakfast. I was happy to let him move forward and take that time. Secretary McDonough, very quickly, uh, we've talked a lot about staff and return to work. Yes. What percentage of the VA's DC staff has returned to in-person work? I don't have a specific number, but I'll get you that specific yeah. number. And yeah. then also submit to me the agency's official telework um, policy. Sure. sure. We want to know that. I've got legislation called the Show Up Work, the Show Up Act, in order to try to get people back to work in these agencies. Okay. Um, the wait times and the backlogs are continuing to grow, and I think that's a problem. Let me ask you also, some of the employers I've talked to in Tennessee have talked about uh, people taking second jobs, second remote work jobs. Hmm. So do you have any employees that have taken second jobs where they're working two jobs remotely? Uh, Has that happened? You know, uh, let me, not, not that I'm aware of, but let me take that and I'll come back to you. Yeah, I would appreciate knowing that and uh, seeing where you are with those issues. Um, I know you were working on a work environment plan. Yep. Okay, uh, what's the status on that? Status is that we, we've submitted a first draft of that to the OMB. In fact, I'm, when I'm done here, I'll be going to a meeting on that uh, okay. over at the, in the interagency. So we're working on that. We feel really strongly about it. I feel quite pr proud of the work that our workforce has carried out in the last couple of years. Productivity, for example, at VBA, uh, the Veterans Benefits Administration, is the highest it's ever been. Okay. Even though they're max telework right now, they are at higher productivity rates than we were in 2019. So what so is I feel the case good about backlog that. now? Right now, the case backlog is about 215,000. Uh, a little bit, it's okay. a little less and than I when I read it, somewhere that PACT Act had uh, you were seeing a half million request for service because of the PACT Act. Is that accurate? We uh, overall, yeah, we've seen about uh, five hundred thousand PACT specific claims filed. Okay. Um, and so, uh, but we, you know, we'll get you the exact data if you want to see. Uh, I know, would love how to many, see that. How many claims filed? How many claims completed? Average uh, time to completion. I'll well, make sure we get you. Of that. course, as you know, I believe community care is a big part of that. And we've got more legislation we're working on that we think would help with that. And we would appreciate hearing from you. I do want to come to something that to me was very troubling as I was reading it last night and looking through the Durham report. And I know you were President Obama's chief of staff from January 13 to January 17. Mm -hmm. And as I was reading through some of this, I, I would like to know from you, uh, during that time as Chief of Staff, did you participate in any meetings with the FBI regarding the investigation of the Trump campaign? You know, I, I, it's been a long time since I've thought about that, but I'll, I, I'll be more than happy to uh, go back and, and take a hard look at that and get you an answer. I would appreciate knowing that. And I, I think it's important to know what your involvement was with the FBI hmm. in pushing for that. Hmm. And my understanding is that 
you were in the 2016 meeting in the Situation Room with President Obama, Susan Rice, and other top officials where they discussed the Russia collusion issue. Is that accurate? I'm not sure I know which meeting you're talking about, but I'd be more than happy to look at it. I think it was July of 2016. Again, I, I... It's reported in the report, and you were in there, and that is of concern to me. You are charged with leading a very important agency. Uh, the work that you do is vital to our veterans, and it is of tremendous concern to me as I was reading this report last night, and it was also a source of disappointment to me. Hmm. that you would have been involved in this process of weaponizing the FBI. This is something that should never hmm. happen. People do not want to see two tiers of justice. And as we talk about the, the VA, they want to see a standard of service for everybody, and they want to see that consistency. And to know that you may have been a participant in this investigation, that you were a part hmm of this meeting as detailed in the Situation Room that uh, they carried out this, hmm. this hoax, this made it all up, figment of her imagination hmm. to discredit someone. I wouldn't want someone discrediting Maggie in that regard hmm. or the chairman or any of us or you. So it is with great disappointment that I read all of that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Hassan. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you and Ranking Member Moran for this hearing. Um, thank you, Secretary McDonough, for being here today uh, and also for our recent conversations. And um, just before I talk a little bit about uh, what we've covered in those recent conversations, I just want to reaffirm that it's my understanding that you agree that all Americans uh, should uh, be equal before the law. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so what we have been talking about in recent weeks is really a major concern to New Hampshire veterans. It's the condition of our Manchester Medical Center. As you know, the Manchester VA Medical Center is 73 years old, and facility maintenance failures have led to the cancellation of many veterans appointments in just the past few years. So I really appreciate ta you taking the time to walk me and Senator Shaheen through the plans that you and your team are working on to ensure that these problems do not continue to recur. I know from our conversation that you and I both care a lot about getting these renovations at Manchester up, yes. up to date and completed. Um, we also talked about the importance of transparency and ensuring that veterans know what is being planned and what they can expect each project, when they can expect each project to be completed. When will you be able to make public a comprehensive plan on projects for the Manchester VA so that veterans will know what to expect? Yeah, thanks Thanks very much for the question and thanks for all the, conver uh, all the work on this. Uh, our goal would be to be able to make something public uh, this summer, summer of 2023, and by that I mean July or August. Okay, um, and I, you know, I, I, I appreciate that, and I think it'll be very important to New Hampshire veterans and yes. to our whole community to yes. meet that deadline, if not earlier. Yep. Um, I appreciate the VA's work to complete much needed repairs at the Manchester VA that were caused by flooding when a pipe burst uh, last year. And I know that your team has been working hard to get these important repairs done as fast as they can. What are the next step beyond these initial repairs to ensure that the Manchester VA is fully renovated to prevent these types of problems in the future? When will the VA start on this work and what is the expected timeline for completion? Yeah, so, uh, you know, the, I'll just talk through a couple of things yeah. here uh, for the record. One is, you know, we're, we're, we need to, many of these renovations are complete guttings of the, yep. uh, these facilities. Uh, we're able to fund those through non-recurring maintenance projects. We have minor construction projects on site, including the new women's health, uh, the women's clinic and specialty right. care addition. We do also have a major construction issue on the seismic project on campus. And the plan is to fully renovate the facility floor by floor so that the facility remains in use during 
those yeah. sequential upgrades. Those renovations include removal and replacement of all obsolete utilities. That includes plumbing. Installation of new insulation on exterior walls to prevent the kind of freezing that we've seen. Installation of new windows. Installation of new modern heating, air conditioning, and ventilation systems. Installation of new finishes and optimized space layout for designed clinical use. Now, here's our approximate schedule. Yeah. Fall of 2023, the fourth floor operating room and the pack U suites uh, will be completed and returned to use. December 2024, the third floor construction will be completed. Spring 2025, the fourth floor construction, which will be partially completed. And then spring 2025, the second floor construction will be completed. Winter 2027, the fifth floor construction completed. And then winter 2026, the sixth floor construction completed. Uh, the women's clinic uh, is expected to be posted uh, for an award uh, this summer. Uh, and the award granted in the fourth quarter of this year. Okay. And then for the women's clinic, the award granted in the fourth quarter of this year, what's the timeline for completion? The timeline for completion, I'm just looking at uh, to make sure. Let me, can I take that one and yeah. get back to you just to make sure that I give you the, the exact number? Yep. Uh, no, I, I, and, and that's fine. I, what I, of course, am trying to communicate is what we have talked about. Exactly, and I'm sorry, uh, I just don't have that number. That, no, that's me. okay, uh, but let, let's get it so we can make yeah. it public to people yeah. so you all have a timeline yep. uh, to, to go by. Um, and I also just think it's really important for people to understand not only the timeline, but that with the overall renovations, what you all are trying to do is make sure that you are repairing this facility to a point where we won't see these kinds of ongoing right. failures, which have really been incredibly disruptive to yes. veterans in New Hampshire. Yep. Thank you. Senator Quick Healing Blumenthal. Good afternoon, Mr. Secretary. Hello, Senator. Uh, the chairman is referring to my leg. I know. It was broken in a Yukon Huskies victory parade. I saw that. I sent you a note too, but it uh, might, it might have gotten stuck. Somewhere. I was just going to say thank you for your note. I apologize for my delay in responding. You're very kind. No. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I want to focus on health care for yes. uh, the veterans of Connecticut and just say I'm hoping that plans for continued work on the VA facility in West Haven are proceeding and yes. I can touch base with you and Count on, on that. that. Count on that. Um, thank you. I, I also want to follow up on a letter that I sent to your office regarding veterans who were stationed at a base in Uzbekistan, K2. Uh, Karshi Khanabad, also known as K2. Um, the Yale Veterans Clinic has brought a lawsuit on behalf of veterans who were stationed there and who were exposed to Soviet-era hazardous waste, including uranium, asbestos, and chemical weapons. Uh, there's ample evidence that they were exposed to these toxins, but there is also uh, a tremendous amount of information in the possession of the Department of Defense. Yes. Records that uh, are still classified for reasons I don't understand. And so I've written to Secretary Austin, urging him to declassify those records. Uh, and I would simply ask you for your commitment that you will support expanding health care to these veterans who were exposed. You've got that commitment. Thank You've you. got that commitment. Uh, thank you. Uh, I want to take a moment to talk about education benefits. Yes. The next generation of veterans is entering a civilian marketplace that's much more dynamic and competitive, as you well know. Uh, I strongly believe the VA can play a critical role in enabling veteran success as the dad of two veterans who uh, have made use of education benefits, thankfully. Uh, 
programs like the Transition Assistance Program, Veterans Readiness, Employment Service, and the GI Bill provide invaluable resources to veterans and their families. I believe that the post-9-11 GI Bill, in particular, is one of the most powerful tools at a veteran's disposal right now. But the educational landscape has changed significantly since President Roosevelt signed the law about 80 years ago. Uh, in your view, uh, how does the VA need to change to meet the needs of these younger veterans? Many of them are of a different mindset. They're exiting the service and want to pursue higher education. And uh, how does the VA need to change its practices or methods to meet those needs? Yeah, I mean, I, th I, I think the main thing we, we have to do is we have to make sure that we're meeting veterans where they are, as I say, fitting our programs into their lives rather than us expecting them to change their lives to meet uh, our requirements, making sure that they understand the, the full uh, suite of support that is available uh, to them, uh, irrespective of what they want to go study uh, or what skills they want to go develop next. And uh, the more we uh, fit that programming into their lives, the better case that we're able to make to them about the usefulness of these, uh, of these investments, uh, the better informed they'll be to make those decisions. It's on us uh, to make that case to individual veterans. Thank you. Uh, I want to offer a, a uh, sort of personal testimonial to the importance of the PAC Act. One of my sons has just gone for screening at the urging of his dad. Uh, his dad. Good. Uh, and was extremely impressed by the quality of the questions and the caring and so forth. Great. So, Excellent. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, Mr. Secretary, good to see you again. Nice to see you. I want to uh, begin by thanking you uh, for the visit to Alaska. It's fun. Appreciated it. Appreciate you getting out uh, all over the state. And, uh, hopefully, you had a good time. Very much. You had a good time. Very much. Hopefully, you enjoyed the steak night at the VFW I in did. Eagle River. But I ate fish. But it was I know you did eat fish. <laughs> You're better Catholic than I am. Um, but. Uh, so I wanted to, and, and I appreciated the uh, uh, broad diversity of meetings that you engaged yeah. in, and, and again, um, getting all over the state with me and Senator Murkowski and Congresswoman Peltola, very much appreciated. I wanted to follow up on the um, meeting you had with uh, Valerie Davidson and the um, ANTHC, the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium. And this is on the uh, different, 26 different reimbursement agreements with uh, the VA um, and these uh, tribal health providers. Yes. Um, on January 5th, 2021, the Proper and Reimbursed Care for Native Veterans Act was signed into law and required the PRC services to be covered the purchase referred care. Mm -hmm. Again, I know you guys had a good discussion on that. Uh, I was part of a lot of that. Yeah. Um, when you met with the ANTHC, uh, it was one of the issues you discussed. Do you guys have, or, or maybe can you provide the committee a firm date when the tribal health providers can expect the agreements to include reimbursements for the PRC services. I, can I get, can I get back yeah, to you with yeah. that? Absolutely. Yeah. I know absolutely. it's complicated and yeah. but it's important issues you yeah, saw. Yeah, absolutely. In Alaska. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Um, look, the next issue. It's an issue I raise every time. I, I sure hope we can we can get the VA's uh, support. I thought we had it, and this is on the the uh, Camp Lejeune um, Victims Act and the lack of. Uh, any contingency fee caps. Um, like I said, I, I don't know why this has taken so long. We, we've put forward a bill that's compromised up to 17% caps. Uh, the VFW supports it, the American Legion supports it, 
Um, there's a whole host of reasons why the 33% that some of my colleagues are suggesting is um, <laughs> it's just too much. And I mean, this is a, literally an example of here's a pot of money. Is it going to go to sick Marines and their families, or is it going to go to trial lawyers? Okay, I can see how trial lawyers can be helpful on some of this, but not at 33%. We were just on the phone with some DOJ folks who, by the way, agree with our bill. I'm trying to get Biden DOJ to come out officially for that. Some of them think that 17% is actually too high. But they're already talking about, just today we heard that, that some of these law firms are charging 50% contingency fees. I mean, it's robbery. We all know it. Everybody in this committee knows it. Everybody in the Congress knows it's wrong. And here's the problem. The deadline for the Camp Lejeune filings is August 2024. So I'm being rope-a-doped. We all know why. The trial lawyers are going to win, and sick Marines and their families are going to lose. So anyways, your team's been good on this. There's all these arguments. Oh, you need good lawyers. I mean, we're going to get good lawyers. You're seeing the ads on TV. These guys aren't doing it out of the goodness of their heart to help the Marines. They're doing it to get rich. So can, can I get your commitment, Mr. Secretary, just in the next week or so to sit down with us saying, yeah. hey, here's where we are. We support the Sullivan Bill. It's reasonable. He's compromised up. The American Legion wants it. VFW wants it. It's one of their top priorities. And the more we delay, by the way, you guys wanted it when we were working on the PACT Act. Just got blocked by some of my colleagues here for reasons we all know about. So any thoughts on that now? We, so, we talked about it in Alaska. Yeah, we did. I care deeply about it because it's just wrong. Yeah. We all know it's wrong. Like, it's I, wrong. I know what a priority this is for you. And but it is for the Marines and their families. Uh, and I'm, I'm not disputing that. And the VFW and the not, American I'm Legion. Not disputing priority that. for all veterans. I'm not disputing that either. Um, uh, I'll, I'll, let me say two things. One, it's, and you know this because you used to work downtown too on the other side. It's hard for me to get in the lane of DOJ and DOD on their requirements. But I'll say this. VA uh, isn't, you know, so, so this question of the right number and whether or not there are caps, that's not really our thing. But I can tell you that we use caps. Yeah. Oh, right? Every law uses caps. On, this is one of the few. The, the Federal our, Claims Torts Act uses caps. So, so This is one of the few that has no caps. I think it's almost exclusively one of the few that, and it's just. So, so I mean, I, uh, I, I, think, you, I think you understand this, this, this spot I'm in, which is I have my interagency partners. The DOJ is the lead. It's a DOD account. I want to make sure that I'm doing my part by them. DOJ, uh, I think, is very for caps. Yeah. I think well, are. again, I, you know, uh, I, I, I'm... Well, how, do you, how would you recommend we try to resolve this? Because you guys obviously play a role because it's veterans. It's the Department of the Navy, as, as you mentioned, so it's DOD. By the way, even the numbers we have from the Department of Navy, just talking to them today, um, almost none of these are going through the adjudication with the Navy. They're, they're going to trial. And the reason they're going to trial is average claim is 10 million bucks. 10 million bucks. Okay, so one of the arguments, Senator Durbin and others, well, you can't, you won't get good lawyers if it's a small contingency fee. Just do the math on that. If you take away 2 million for the, um, what's called the uh, health award, health care received out of 10 million, that's 8 million. 17% of 8 million is $1.36 million. That's a pretty good payday for a lawyer. So that's from the Navy today. So the Navy wants it, DOJ wants it. I think you guys want it. I just, it kind of sickens me that we can't get progress on this. So maybe, do you have a suggestion on what we would do? Seriously, the Congress, the committee, those three agencies, because this is an injustice. The money's going to trial lawyers, 50% contingency fees. We heard that today. Some of your guys testified last fall, uh, you know, there's up to 60%. Yeah. Jeez Louise, how greedy can you be? 
why, so my commitment to you is why don't you why don't you let me talk to Secretary Austin and let me or to uh, Garland. Uh, Sec I'm sorry, and to the Attorney General um, and to the Secretary of the Navy and and let me see uh, if I understand precisely what they're doing on this. I, I want to not in public session get ahead of them on whatever it is that they're doing. Um, so, okay. all right. Okay, Mr. Chairman, it's an issue. The ranking members, I just kind of baffled that we're letting this linger. And look, I know why some people want it to linger because August 2024 is a deadline, and then it's over. Then the trial lawyers win, and the Marines get screwed, and that's just wrong, totally wrong. Everybody knows it. Every everybody knows it, and we're not doing a damn thing about it. Just you guys are gonna rope a dope me. You're going to rope a dope me. You're not rope a dope me. You're rope and doping sick Marines and their families. Really, really, really makes me mad. And everybody knows it's the wrong thing to do. I don't know why we're not more urgent about this. All of us. Senator Sullivan, uh, you've brought this up in many different forums, and I appreciate it. I know you feel passionate about it. But I want to give you a little history so you know. I don't know if you're on this committee, but Senator Burr served in leadership on this committee, but he's the one that started the Camp Lejeune. Senator Tillis took that up, that bill, along with Senator Blumenthal. Yeah. And it was debated many, many times. And it was introduced, and we put it into the PACT Act. Now, um, with no contingency, the fact with is, no caps. The when, fact we wanted right. caps, Mr. Chairman. No, no, no. Your side. I, you, I was in every, the cap, nearly you every fought one, the caps. That's, every that's one the of these truth. hearings, I, know I the did truth. not hear anything. I know the truth about caps, and I was in every one of the hearings. Let's be clear. Yeah, I know the truth. Okay. Then why let's, don't you agree, to, be why do you agree to my 70% bill right because now? Because it's it's my bill or the highway. Okay. Senator Durbin also has a bill that's I've supported moved, by I've, VSOs. I've moved up from 10% to 17%. Senator Durbin also has a bill. You commit VSOs. to me to work with me to get and, caps. And I'm all about reasonable fees. But I'll also tell you something else I'm about. I'm about choice. And I, I don't want the federal government telling me who I'm going to hire for an attorney. And I don't think we should be telling Marines that. And don't trust give me, me that. that's you just, know that that's exactly that is baloney. The case. Every you know that's that. exactly the every. Case. Don't give me that. You have no idea what you're talking about. Every federal don't, law. Don't, don't, every, don't, don't, every, don't, don't. Give every, me the high and mighty. Every, I'm giving you high and mighty because no. I'm doing the right thing for the Marines. And too. I want to do the right thing by the Marines then too. You but you know this it. is a place of compromise. I, I moved from 10 percent. To 17 percent already. We can, That's we called can compromise. To have this right now, you guys. Right now, you guys are going to rope a dope this, so the deadline happens and there's no caps. Let's be honest. You think having no we caps could have no caps, caps tomorrow you if think? you would come to the table? That's ridiculous. I've been working this. Move on Don't give me that, panel. Mr. Chairman. You know what? We're As the chairman of the Veterans Affairs panel. Committee, you are. This is a dereliction of duty on your part. I, right now, I, I, and it I burns love, me up. I love your claims, but back them up with facts. Yeah, I have all the facts in the world. You make them up. You guys made sure there was no caps. That's, That's what happened. That is That's total facts. baloney. Then agree to my bill. Total baloney. And there's bills out there supported by the VSOs that will get caps. The VSOs the support my bill. V VSOs support Durbin's bill, too. And by the way, this is a uh, uh, an issue that needs to be taken up by Durbin's committee. It's the jurisdiction of this committee. No, it isn't. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a jurisdiction. Where did the Camp Lejeune Act come from? It, it came from here. Right. That's the bill. But when you're talking about legal issues, it automatically goes. Come on, Mr. Chairman. You're stumbling over your words. No, I'm not. You need to fix no, this I'm with not. me. No, I'm not. And it's By the fixable. way, you committed in front of the it's, VS, when the VSOs were the American Legion, and when all the veterans were here in front of this committee, 500, and I asked you to work with this on me, and they all cheered. They won it. They support my bill. And they you support Durbin's my... bill, too. <laughs> why would that they one support... doesn't count. Why, why would they support a bill that takes 20% more of a chunk out of, their, out, of, out, of, out of their um, that one doesn't out of their award that they've earned? They do. Well, I wish you'd commit right now to work with me on this. It's pretty hard to work with somebody who... Wants what to cares about Marines wants to make a families? political issue out of something? I'm not making fix. a political issue at all. All I've been trying to do is put caps on awards, which is what every federal bill in the in the country 
that we pass has. And I think this is one of the few that has no cap and that can on happen. attorney fees. It can happen. All right. I'm ready you to work. I want it to happen. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator, uh, Secretary McDonald. We appreciate your testimony. We appreciate your answers. I would ask that there will be other questions by members of the committee. Make sure you respond to them in a timely manner. That concludes our first panel, and uh, we'll start with the second panel now. Interestingly enough, we're going to hear in the second panel, we're going to hear from VSOs. Uh, each year, the independent budget offers an informed perspective on the VA needs in order to live up to the promises we made those who have served our nation. I've said many times that Congress needs to take its cues from the veterans, and we do. And I look forward to hearing your thoughts on this year's budget proposal. First, I want to introduce Morgan Brown, National Legislative Director of PVA, Paralyzed Veterans of America. I also have Shane Learman, Deputy National Legislative Director of Disabled American Veterans. Lastly, we have Patrick Murphy, Director of the National Legislative Service of the VFW Veterans uh, of Foreign Wars. They are going to provide, as I said, my opening statement, one joint statement on behalf of 1B. Before you begin, gentlemen, though, I uh, want to say that uh, we have a nomination hearing coming up on a Deputy Secretary for the VA, um, Tanya Bradshaw. That hearing is going to be held on May 31st at 3 p.m. I would just encourage all the members of this committee to meet with her and visit with her and find out what she's made of. With that, I turn it over to the, the floor to you three gentlemen, and whoever wants to start can. All right, Chairman Tester, Ranking Member Moran, and members of the committee, on behalf of the Independent Budget Veteran Service Organizations, DAV, PVA, and VFW, I want to thank you for the opportunity to offer our comments on VA's budget request for fiscal year 2024 and advanced appropriations for fiscal year 25. Our recommendation of nearly $140 billion for medical care spending in fiscal year 2024 and $157 billion of advanced appropriations for fiscal year 25 represents our best estimates of the funding VA needs to fully and timely deliver all authorized programs, services, and benefits to America's veterans. We were encouraged by the administration's proposed budget for the VA and believe much of it accurately reflects the rising need for health care and benefits by those who serve, their families, families, caregivers, and survivors. However, it missed the mark in a few areas. For example, VA's medical and prosthetics research program generates discoveries that significantly contribute to improving the health of veterans and all Americans. The administration requested $938 million in FY 2024 compared to the $980 million recommended by the IB. As you know, the VA healthcare system has faced significant challenges and undergone historic reforms in recent years to improve veterans' access to timely and high-quality health care. While VA has received increased funding levels to support the veterans' health care system and an increasing number of veterans are seeking VA care, the lack of resources for adequate staffing and facility improvements are adversely impacting accessibility to care and benefits and must be addressed. We urge Congress to honor the promise made to the men and women who served our country by continuing your longstanding bipartisan support of those who have borne the battle. This concludes our remarks on health care. Mr. Lehrman from DAV will now discuss benefits programs. Thank you. The IBVSOs recommend approximately $4.1 billion for VBA's operation, an increase of roughly $406 million over the current appropriations level. This includes an additional $100 million for overtime. In fiscal year 2022, VBA completed over 1.7 million rating decisions done with mandatory overtime. VBA has already completed 1.1 million decisions in this fiscal year. This $100 million in overtime will greatly enhance VBA's production to address the increase in claims due to the PACT Act, the existing pending claims, and drive down the backlog. Mr. Chairman, within VA call centers, there are approximately 1,600 employees. It is estimated that one VA claim, one VA claim generates eight separate contacts to VA call centers. As of May 6th, there are over 800,000 pending claims and VA is predicting over 1 million new claims, which means that VA could receive over 8 million phone calls to the call centers, 
which would significantly strain the existing workforce. Therefore, we are recommending $50 million for an additional 400 VA call center employees. In reference to the Board of Veterans' Appeals, we recommend approximately $325 million, an increase roughly of $40 million. In fiscal year 2022, the Board scheduled over 56,000 hearings, but held only a little over 30,000 hearings. At the beginning of this fiscal year, the Board had over 75,000 hearings pending. We recommend an additional 20 veterans law judges, an additional 200 FTE, and other positions to assist in driving down the backlog. The estimated cost is approximately $20 million. Thank you. This concludes my remarks, and I turn to VFW's Pat Murray. Mr. Chairman, although the asset and infrastructure review process broke down and stalled last year due in part to concerns about assumptions and market assessments, many of VA's recommendations for expansion and construction of new health care facilities, as well as repairs and maintenance of existing ones, were widely supported and merit funding. I to you. VA capital infrastructure's backlog of projects continues to grow faster than VA can address them. Neither VA's Office of Construction and Facilities Management nor the individual VA facilities have the staff to oversee the amount of work necessary to decrease the backlog. Investing in the oversight and completion of these critical projects will save VA money in the long term and potentially save lives if done correctly. VA must hire additional FTE to oversee infrastructure projects. Adding personnel to an Office of Strategic Planning and increasing the personnel at individual major facilities to oversee local projects is critical to decreasing this backlog. <clears throat> As stated in previous hearings, VA has an infrastructure backlog of $105 to $129 billion. VA should be requesting at least $10 to $13 billion annually to address this. If we keep underfunding VA infrastructure beneath the necessary amounts, in five years we'll be talking about the $120 to $150 billion backlog in projects. The details in the skip list outline the true need for the infrastructure work at VA, but VA's request does not match the real need. It is only a fraction of the total amount necessary. We urge this committee and the appropriations committees to look at the actual need for infrastructure and provide VA the resources they need instead of what they're asking for. Chairman Tester, Ranking Member Moran, thank you for the opportunity for the authors of the independent budget to provide our remarks on these important topics. We're prepared to answer any questions you may have. I appreciate uh, all three of your testimonies. Thank you very much for being here. I'm gonna start with uh, you, Mr. Brown. Last month, we, uh, we tried to do a package of bills to do right by our veterans called the Elizabeth Dole Veterans Program Improvement Act 2023. These were five bills that were introduced in this committee that we combined. They were sent out of committee in February unanimously. However, many of my colleagues blocked it from advancing and becoming law. Uh, what this bill did, as you well know, I believe, is it improved home care options for veterans, which basically would save money in the long run and improve quality of life. It would direct VA to study the use of medicinal cannabis for treating the invisible wounds of war. That doesn't mean the VA was outgrowing cannabis. They'd actually be interviewing veterans and finding out the impact that cannabis has on them. And it would help Native Americans and Alaska veterans achieve ownership of homes. Um, I know the PVA um, was, a, was, was a supporter of this legislation. Uh, Mr. Brown, can you just tell us what further delayed passage of this veteran means for the folks who are part of your organization? Certainly, Mr. Chairman. The members of this committee well know that the number of veterans that are going to be needing long-term care is expected to significantly increase uh, over the next yeah. decade. Oh, wow. And it's important that VA implements policies now to ensure that these veterans can safely age at home and remain active participants in their communities. Unfortunately, VA's home and community-based services are not offered at all VA healthcare facilities, even though they're desperately needed. The Elizabeth Dole Veterans Programs Improvement Act would have ensured programs like Veterans Directed Care, Homemaker Home Health, and home-based primary care are available at all VA medical centers, giving greater number of veterans, catastrophically disabled veterans, the ability to receive care in their homes, which is where they would prefer to receive it. 
It also instructs VA to test a program that would provide home health aids for veterans residing in communities where there's a shortage of home health aids. And as you know, the, the shortage of home health aids is severely impeding access uh, for veterans as well as many aging Americans uh, to receive needed home care. The IBVSOs have been very supportive of efforts like this to help curb the effects of these shortages and bolster the direct care workforce. And although it was not included in the, the Elizabeth Dole uh, Improvement Act, we appreciate your and the ranking members' commitment to finding a way to raise the cap on the amount that VA can pay for the cost of home care. This provision in particular is extremely important to the few hundred veterans whose care is their ser of their service-connected conditions exceeds the cap, and therefore they must pay out of their pocket, rely on Medicaid, or be placed in an institutional setting. Okay. Thank you. Um, this question is for all three of you. I'll try to make it very quick, and you guys be quick on your answers. As you know, the Veterans Employment and Training Service at the Department of Labor handles the trans transition employment and homeless veterans programs. Uh, this includes TAP classes, homeless veteran reintegration program. Labor has indicated that budget cuts would affect all these programs and lead to reduced services for our veterans. I'm particularly concerned about cutting services to our homeless veterans who need help of the department to be able to find living wage jobs. So please tell us about the real world effects of cutting DOL's veteran services. And if a return to FY 2022 uh, levels of funding would hurt uh, homeless, jobless, transitioning veterans. You can you can start again, Morgan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this is going to have a huge impact on DOL for a lot of reasons, but specifically, it's going to hurt their homeless veteran reintegration program through the Department of Labor and for Veterans. It is estimated that it's going to basically <coughs> take away that potential for up to 5,000 homeless veterans for job training for additional skills, even those homeless and those at risk. We're also concerned that it could potentially even have some overlap and some uh, problems with the DOL and with TAP specifically, which will impact hundreds of thousands of veterans being separated from service. Okay, anybody like to add to that? Good enough. Uh, I can add just a little bit if I would, um, if I may. Um, the VA's annual suicide report noted that the largest cohort of veterans dying by suicide are those that are aged 18 to 24. And it's important to remember that DOL Vets is one of the few agencies that engages with this particular group of veterans, either through the TAP program or through employment services. So these pro many of these positions have already been impacted by reduced budgeting and cutting them even further could be detrimental to the lives of these veterans. Well, one final question. Uh, Pat, you got to hear the uh, conversation between Senator Sullivan and myself about two bills, one that he has and one that uh, Senator Durbin has. On caps, could you uh, let us know? But I think you, your organization supports both bills. Could you let us know your thoughts? We do, Senator uh, Tester. We support putting reasonable caps on uh, any bills uh, that, that affect the Camp Lejeune Justice Act. Uh, it's similar to our concern about unaccredited uh, claims assistance, taking exorbitant amounts of money from veterans. We wanna see reasonable caps put in place. We hope that our uh, supporters in the House and the Senate will come to a good compromise to make sure that veterans, and specifically in this case, those Marines from years ago are taken care of. Chairman, thank you. Um, one of the things I think about the PACT Act that it is, it, it, I appreciate is its attempt at trying to provide some fairness to veterans who separated from uh, service uh, more than 10 years ago, uh, within the last 10 years, excuse me. And what, what's your view of how well the department is uh, conducting the outreach necessary to get those and really other veterans uh, do we need to be focused on encouraging, insisting, reviewing, asking questions of the VA about that effort? Uh, I'll go ahead and take that one real quick, Senator. Um, for 25 years, I've been a DAV accredited benefits advocate. Uh, I've been a, seeing all of the different programs that have come into effect over the last 25 years. 
And, and I would have to say unequivocally, I've never seen an outreach campaign like the VA is doing now with the PACT Act ever before in my career. Never with when they added uh, additional benefits for Vietnam veterans, um, not when they made changes in the late 90s, not even in the 2000s. So I think it's impressive of what they've already done. Um, and I think that they can do more, but specifically, um, they've already conducted 1,560 PACT Act awareness events around the country. I've attended several myself. I think VA has been more collaborative with the VSO community in a lot of these events and conversations than I've seen in any other program since the Appeals Modernization Act. Uh, Shane, Mr. Learman, I'm, I'm happy to when I hear compliments that good things are happening. It's not that I'm looking for an answer that says they're failing. Anybody else uh, need to comment on that arena? Okay. Um, one of the problems that, that we're experiencing, uh, I understand it's a budgetary issue. It's one that we raised during the debate about the PACT Act is the we created the Toxic Exposure Fund, and it's been a bit of a battle um, from time to time in this committee, but it is, it certainly has been, you know, successful in setting aside resources. I understand that's important, but it, for, it also has unintentionally created new mandatory scoring implications for VA legislation that previously relied on discretionary funding only. Um, we saw that, in fact, in the bill that, the, the bill we took to the floor uh, that Senator Tester just asked Mr. Brown about. We need to find a way that gets us in a position in which every other bill is not handicapped by the score of CBO creating the necessary PAYGO rules uh, to be complied with. Any thoughts about, I mean, maybe your answer is that we forego PAYGO, uh, not probably a solution that's going to be happen in these days, but I would suggest that uh, we need some help in figuring out how we, without being accused of doing anything harmful to the PACT Act, I want to be, uh, and not only just not accused, not doing anything harmful to the PACT Act, I want to find a way in which we can solve this problem so that we can move forward with other pieces of legislation that are important to other veterans as well. Any thoughts? Senator Moran, I'm very glad you brought up first, skipping PAYGO. But, um, what we really want to do, we received a briefing uh, just last week, I believe it was, from CBO, and they talked about some of the, what we believe, some of the more outrageous things that uh, they're looking at could come from the Tax Exposure Fund. I believe it was VA police scheduling system was one of the more outlandish uh, examples they used. That's not what the PACT Act uh, Tax Exposure Fund was intended for. Uh, we hope that we can clarify that, that we believe will help ease the scoring problem. So in the, your suggestion, Patrick, is that just it's education of CBO and it's scoring uh, information? I think that would be step one. Okay. Um, what was in the law is not VA police scheduling system. So some clarification on that I think would help. Okay. Anybody else? Um, I appreciate that answer and at least the, the second part of your answer. The uh, because I think this is really important. It's going to be a problem for us time and time again if we don't get this scoring issue with CBO resolved. And I'm pleased that the VFW and perhaps others are doing in some of our work in, in education of the CBO. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Brown, I wanted to follow up on your point uh, on raising the cap for non-institutional uh, extended care services. Uh, if you want to contradict me, you may, certainly, and I won't be offended, but my understanding is that we are working to fulfill the commitment that we made to work to find a solution. Uh, $13 billion was the score for that provision. We don't think that's accurate, and we're trying at this point to get information from the Department of Veterans Affairs so that we can go back to CBO to get something much more, which we believe, realistic than what they are currently thinking. So. We're, we are trying to educate the, the CBO as well, uh, but to do that, we need the help from the Department of Veterans Affairs with the information and data, the statistics that they have. Am I missing anything? No, sir. It sounds like we are in 100% agreement on that. Great. Uh, thank you all. Uh, I do want to thank you for being here. I appreciate what you guys do, uh, how you represent your members, and 
and being able to be here. Look, some of you guys have a cot in the back room because you're here at every hearing, and I appreciate that. Uh, we make a promise to those who serve our country uh, to deliver for them. And if the VA is going to make good on that promise, uh, they have to have resources to do so. I think that uh, both the Secretary and you gentlemen have shared valuable insight uh, as we move forward with the appropriations process for 2024. Uh, this includes ensuring the VA has resources it needs to implement the PACT Act and continue to improve care, improve care and services for veterans of all eras. With that, we will keep the record open for a week and this hearing is adjourned. <laughs>